Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning indeed. Welcome to Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us today. Others are worshiping with us online and we're glad you're joining us. As you know, a very special Sunday. Now, if you're a, a guest, we extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you're here to worship with us. Members and guests, please, if you haven't already, register your attendance there and pass that connection pad down so that everyone can sign that. It helps our office a great deal. And if you're a first-time visitor in particular, please give us a way to say thank you for worshiping with us and to invite you back to be with us again. Now, if you are a first-time visitor, you may wonder why in the world there was applause <laughs> during the processional. And that's because today we're going to have the chancel choir back in the loft after a summer break, and we are so pleased to see that choir loft filled. We are so blessed at Christ of the Hills with an incredible music ministry and we are so thankful for our chancel choir. I know we will all be blessed, not only today, but throughout the season, all the way till next summer when they may get tired again. <laughs> they may, but I don't know. They're, they're, they're pretty good. They really, really are. So again, we welcome you now. Very, very special Sunday for another reason. You see the basket of undies up here. Today is Undie Sunday, September the 8th, and this is just a small sampling of the many, many... Uh, contributions through undies and other things that are out in fellowship hall in your fellowship hall time you'll 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 see this and and be reminded of the blessing that your contributions whether it's cash or bringing actual items like this to the church these are being packaged and distributed in our community uh, to those in need and what a very very special ministry very unique for Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. We'll later in the service have a blessing over this basket and all of the, the ministry that uh, uh, the, the people who will be touched by this ministry. Now, I want to mention one more, well, a couple of more things. Number one, men, United Methodist men, we're here in September. Already this Friday will be our United Methodist men's breakfast. That's at 8 o'clock. And it's uh, $5, the best uh, deal in town. And if you're a first-time guest to our United Methodist Men's Breakfast, of course, that's free. So folks begin to gather early for coffee and conversation. And this also will be coming back after our summer break. So I hope you'll uh, come and make that a wonderfully attended program, always a very enjoyable thing. The program this week will be Jane Browning, who's the executive director of the Hot Springs Village Community Foundation. So come and join us on Friday morning. Now I want to mention one more thing, very special thing, and that is I want you all to be looking at the Village Voice this Tuesday. Can you do that? You probably do every Tuesday, but look at the Village Voice this week. You're going to be seeing a very special segment now that uh, we're, we're going to be doing at Christ of the Hills, part of a program, and that's going to be a testimonial from two of our folks. Uh, both of them sitting in the choir behind me right now with Larry Venable and Joe West. And they're going to be doing a testimonial on why they love Christ of the Hills, why they came here, and, and why they think this is a wonderful church to be a part of the faith family. And so we're going to be able to start doing that as part of the program we're calling the Bring In More, the Bring In More program. Our church vision is to bring in, build up, and reach out. And so we're going to be uh, bringing in more. And that's part of a program. This is part of that, only a small part of it. You're going to be hearing more about that throughout this fall season. One thing we're going to be doing two weeks from today, and we had a couple of new members last week, and two weeks from today on the 22nd, we're going to be having a new member Sunday. We already have several folks who have been visiting for a while who have said, I want to join on that day on new member Sunday. And uh, so we'll be contacting others who have been part of the congregation, the worshiping congregation, but uh, haven't actually joined the church. And we're going to be contacting some of you, perhaps, to say, would you consider on that day coming and, and making it official so that you're a part of this congregation's membership? So it'll be a new member Sunday, and uh, we look forward to that. And then in October, we're going to be having a new member lunch that's provided out in Fellowship Hall after church one Sunday. I think that's the 20th or somewhere around that time. In October so remember those things that are coming up do look at the village voice and imagine yourself writing your own article in one of the month uh, uh, one of the months out in the future to share your excitement about your worshiping family okay 
All right, let's stand together now and take your order of worship and join in the call to worship. This is a responsive reading from the 89th Psalm. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, great and awesome above all the heavenly beings. Our God, great and awesome above all the heavenly beings. Turn to number 154 and we'll sing all hail the power of Jesus' name, omitting verse 3. affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. Let's join together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
flowers on the altar are given to the glory of God in celebration of the return of our choir to Sunday worship. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be good. The flowers in the Welcome Center are given to the glory of God by Ray and Deanna Hicklin in celebration of their 60th wedding anniversary. Oh, give God some praise. Yeah. All right. We do extend our sympathies and prayers uh, to Mike Sigelman, his nephew, Eric Miser had passed away, and so continue to keep that family in your prayers, as well as the others who are listed here. Please keep them in your prayers, too. Will you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Almighty and gracious God, come, Jesus, come. I listened to that song this morning, Come, Jesus, Come. There's a part in there that said, you could come today. And the thing is that we move who believe in you through a river of grace. And in that grace, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are blessed We are changed. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. A lot of things are starting brand new today. We have the choir. I didn't sweat getting out to the truck. My truck said 50 degrees. It's amazing to see the leaves start to change and a lot of different things happening, oh Lord. But you are the same. Praise be to you, oh God, you are the same. So Father, search through us this morning. What if you did come today? Beloved, are you ready for that time? So, Father, search us. Allow us to surrender those things to you. Redeem us. Pour over your grace through us, O oh God. Bring that which we need to get rid of up to you. Purify us. Father, this new season, as we call it. Uncover our eyes. As your church, as one of many churches, help us to go out as we do reach out and not miss opportunities at which we could share you with the world. So, Father, we thank you. We pray a blessing over those that we have on our prayer lists, in our celebrations, on our prayer wall. We lift up our concerns this morning. You're an amazing God. All-powerful God. We sing about you. Help us to live for you. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
<laughs> wonderful. What a wonderful message and song. Thank you so much. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Romans. I'll be reading chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Hear these words of scripture. <clears throat> We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. earlier that today is a very special day in that this is the Sunday that we dedicate the undies. Now I must admit 14 in 2014 when I came here I hadn't been here very long when I heard them announce we're going to have undie Sunday. I was actually concerned until I got clarification on that. <laughs> but it is an incredible ministry that we have very unique and it's a, it's a direct and helpful way that we can impact our community with the love of God. So let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we offer our offertory prayer and dedication. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude for the blessings you have poured into our lives we ask you once again to bless our tithes and offerings, but also today we offer these gifts. We lift up our mission of Undy Sunday, where we share the simple yet vital gift of new underwear for children in need. We thank you for the generosity of this congregation who have answered the call to provide for those who often go without. Bless these donations and use them as a sign of your love and care, bringing dignity and comfort to the young students in our community. 
May each pair remind them that they are seen, valued, and loved. Empower us to continue reaching out with compassion so that our hands may be your hands and our hearts reflect your heart. Lord, we ask you to multiply these gifts and may they inspire hope and joy in those who receive them. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. standing and let us continue worshiping by singing hymn number 370 hymn number 370 victory in jesus 
please be seated. Now, as you're being seated, to look at this uh, passage that I've given you, actually two passages I've given you, we just sang victory in Jesus. So let's look at the bottom passage first. This is from Romans 8, the passage that uh, Reverend Sheila read a moment ago. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We have victory in Jesus, in other words, through him, who loved us. I love that more than conquerors in the Greek New Testament, the original Greek New Testament is just one word, huperneke, which means a super victor. Nike, if you wear Nike shoes, that's a Greek word that means victory. Huper or super Nike means you are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. And we are being conformed into his image. Christ defeated the greatest giant enemy of all and that is death and we are more than conquerors over death through Jesus Christ who loved us now David Jesus is called the son of David right and David was also a giant killer the giant Goliath and so that top passage I've given you comes from Zechariah chapter 12 on that day, the Lord will shield the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. So conformed to an image of David, as it were, a giant killer, and then conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, a true giant killer, winning a victory over death, victory in Jesus. On that day, the feeblest shall be like David. Now look at these images I've given you, and let's start with that top image. On this day, 520 years ago, September the 8th, 1504, Michelangelo's masterpiece of the Italian Renaissance sculpture was unveiled to the public in Florence. Michelangelo had been releasing David from that enormous block of Carrara marble for three years having been commissioned in 1501 to sculpt this biblical hero. And if David is a colossal figure in Hebrew history, the sculpture itself is colossal. 17 feet tall, which is the reason that in Florence, Michelangelo's David is known as Il Gigante. I take that as the title of my sermon today. Il Gigante, meaning the giant. When you defeat a giant, you become a giant. How many of you have been to Florence to see this amazing sculpture? So many of you have. I'm, I'm jealous of you. We were to go there in, uh, in Florence uh, right before COVID. We had a trip planned. Some of you were going to be on that trip with me, and then COVID, of course, changed our plans. When you defeat a giant, you become a giant. That's the message I see in Michelangelo's David. Michelangelo himself was a giant in his craft. He was only 26 years old when he received the commission in 1501 to do this uh, sculpture. But two years earlier, at the age of 24, hard to believe, he had finished the Pietà, the famous Pietà, the phenomenal sculpture of the crucified body of Jesus laying across, spread across the lap of his mother Mary, which resides today, of course, at St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican in Rome. I have seen that many times, and I know... My, okay, raise your hand if you've seen, if you've seen the Pietà at the Vatican. So many, about the same number. The Pietà spreading the body of Jesus across the lap of Mary, such an, a famous sculpture, spread Michelangelo's fame throughout every corner of Italy. Europe and beyond and now two years later he's now 26 years old he arrives back to his hometown of Florence as a hero he's a giant himself and he's going to release from this block of unsightly stone the heroic form of a young man named David the songwriter shepherd of the fields of Bethlehem anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel the story of Il Gigante is truly amazing he sculpted it from a massive, cast-off piece of Carrara marble, 18 feet long, which had laid for nearly 40 years 
in the Florence Cathedral's workyard. It was the abandoned project of a lesser talent. So it had just laid there for 40 years, exposed to the elements, weeds all over, dirt and grime. Could anything appear less promising than the block of marble that Michelangelo started when he crafted this masterpiece? Civic leaders in Florence was a city in the midst of its own civic crisis at that time. They were very proud of their native son's newfound acclaim. They saw in this block of marble laying in the workyard an opportunity. I wonder who it was that first looked at that cast-off slab of marble and saw the beyond of what it was, looking past the weeds, past the dirt, past the grime, to see a giant that would impact our world even now 500 years later. Transforming that unsightly block of dirtied marble into this giant of Hebrew history would serve to remind the citizens of Florence that they, like the ancient Israelites, were a people chosen by God. That was the message that the civic leaders of Florence wanted to give Florence, the citizens. And more than that, that Il Gigante would project strength against the gigantic obstacles that their their public face. It was a time of public crisis and the project was calculated to project confidence so that if the people imagined themselves to be feeble in the face of their challenges, they could believe that they themselves could be made, fashioned, created like David. You in that day will be like David, more than conquerors, giant killers. So the city needed a symbol to remind them how God uses unexpected instruments to defeat giants. And Michelangelo gave them the most famous of all, David. The thought that the project might be awarded to Leonardo da Vinci lit a fire under Michelangelo. He couldn't stand the idea that his rival would uh, land that commission in his own hometown of Florence. Michelangelo, at 26 years old, was new to the scene. Leonardo was 21 years older. He was 47 years old, and of course already his fame was, was wide throughout Europe. And Michelangelo came back to Florence and sold his new fame uh, through the Pietà, and he returned to Florence with his head held high. He was greeted as a giant, and he won the city's commission. The two are so different. Their creative styles between Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were so different. Unlike Leonardo, who loved to open his studio and work in the full view, he wanted everyone to see the process of his creating of a masterpiece. He would have loved our time with painting with Bob Ross, you know. <laughs> he would have loved that. I can see him just like Bob Ross saying, we don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents. <laughs> that's, that's the Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo preferred to work in private. He wanted the silence of his own thoughts, uninterrupted. He wanted to spring his masterpiece on the public after months or even years of toil, and working, waiting. In the For What It's Worth department, every person in creating their own craft, whatever your craft may be, are either Leonardo's in their leadership style or they're Michelangelo's. When you're crafting something, your craft, are you a Leonardo? You want everyone to see the process that goes into making your creation? Or are you a Michelangelo craving privacy and silence until you're ready to reveal it? I myself am a Michelangelo. My whole... <clears throat> My whole idea of creating a sermon or a lesson series or whatever it may be is leave me alone. <laughs> That's my refrain during the time of creating. And if I don't like it, right when I get to the end, I'll crumple it up and throw it away and no one will ever know what an accident it is. I don't have happy accidents. I have big accidents <laughs> and throw it away. Well, with David... Michelangelo's element of surprise was today, September the 8th, 1504, 520 years ago, when he unveiled to Florence this masterpiece. Now I want you to look at the middle image, which is really just a close-up of what you see at the top image. Here was the surprise. 
Most artists of that period, the Renaissance period, in their depictions of David, preferred to show David in his moment of victory. David's foot may be resting on the severed head of Goliath or holding the sword by which he severed that head of Goliath. Michelangelo's surprise was to show David in the moment prior to engaging the battle. In the moment when nothing was decided, when everything was at risk. You might compare the two by saying one of them is the hallelujah moment of victory. David's already won the victory. And the other is the Hosanna moment. Hosanna is a Hebrew word meaning save us, please. It's what they said to Jesus when Jesus was coming in the city of Jerusalem to begin what we call Holy Week. They were saying, Hosanna, save us, please. The battle had not yet been won. The battle was ready to be engaged. So Hosanna is the moment of uncertainty, prayer, pleading, unlikely possibility. And Michelangelo gives us King David, or long before he's king, he gives us David, not in the moment of victory when nothing more is at stake, but in the midst of the drama when everything is at stake. Perfect for the people of Florence and what they needed at that day. Because at that moment they were grappling with uncertainty. For the citizens of Florence, this time was not a hallelujah time. Thank God we've won the victory. But a hosanna time. Save us, Lord, please. Save us. We're in dire straits. Each of our lives fluctuates back and forth. Between hosanna moments, Lord, I need you, and hallelujah moments. Thank you, Lord. In fact, we can be having both of them at the same time because we have different arenas in our life. In one area of our life, let's say our business, our financial area of our life, you may be in a place where you say, Hallelujah, thank you God, I feel secure. And yet in another area of your life, say a health challenge or an emotional challenge or a relationship challenge, you may be at a Hosanna moment. Everything's fine over here, but everything's not fine over here. Lord, save me, help me. Florence was in that please God help mode. So in that middle image, that close-up image, you have Michelangelo's Il Gigante catching David in the moment of uncertainty. No victory here. His eyes are averted to the side. Look at his neck. A tensing of muscles in his neck. A furrowing of his brow. As he sees the approaching threat, we're not allowed to see it. His sling rests in his left hand as Goliath approaches. So Michelangelo's David here is in what we might call the liminal moment. That is to say, the moment of in-betweenness. Will he win? Don't know. Will he lose? Maybe. Michelangelo offers us David then between the conscious decision to risk it all and the moment of action itself. The outcome uncertain facing the giant would David prove himself to be a giant or will the giant prove itself to be the giant we don't know yet but what we do know yet is that the odds are not in David's favor I must share with you my favorite story of Michelangelo's David in 1504 David was nearly complete the unveiling was, was coming close. This was in early summer of 1504. He could no longer re reject and ignore, ignore and reject all the requests from city officials to come see for themselves the progress. They were paying for this. They wanted to see the progress. And Michelangelo had said, stay away. Vasari, his early biographer, tells the story of Piero Sotterini who was a leading city official who was finally allowed to go behind the walls and see what Michelangelo was creating. And he was well pleased. But he said to Michelangelo that it seemed to him that David's nose was a little wider than it should be, a little too thick. So in order to satisfy him, Michelangelo climbed up on the staging. He took a chisel in one hand and he gathered some dust, some marble dust from the top of the planks. And he was tapping just very, very lightly and letting the dust fall out of his hand little by little. So that Vasari, his early biographer, said that the statue of David was nor changed a whit from what it was before, to quote him. 
So looking down at the official, Michelangelo said, look at it now. I like it better, he said. <laughs> you have given it life. So Michelangelo came down smiling on the inside, amused at so easily satisfying ones who so arrogantly thought that they knew his craft better than he knew his craft, when actually knowing very little. Perhaps there are, in our lives, moments when we are at that in-between moment that David is in here. We've heard the call. We know we may need to step up to whatever that may be. We've made the decision to act, and yet the outcome is still uncertain. We're in that Hosanna moment. Lord, be with me. Save me, as David prayed. If Michelangelo released Il Gigante from a cast-off piece of stone, the question here is what giant resides within you? That life's experiences working as a sculptor is chipping away to conform you, not just to the image of David. In that day you will be like David. Even the feeblest among you, the most unlikely among you, rising to the challenge, but to the greater David, to Jesus Christ himself, as our passage from Romans 8 said, that we are being conformed to the image of his son, like a cast-off piece of marble being made into David. We may look unlikely, we may be covered with dirt and grime and weeds in our life, and yet God's Holy Spirit is chipping away as the masterpiece becomes, well, you. You are God's masterpiece. To know your true worth as a child of God and our calling to become ourselves more than we yet are. Truth is, we have both of those moments in our lives the hallelujah moment where the victory's won and the ready to rest and thank you God the victory is here. But we also have and all of us have areas in our life where we're in the Hosanna moment. Please God, the drama is still unfolding and that calls for preparation and readiness and determination and for vision and for hope and for faith. The key in our becoming a giant killer though, and I end with this, is unselfishness. It's not about you. It's not just for yourself. The victory is never ours alone. David's courage was for Israel. He was standing for Israel, not for himself. And our call is to have courage to be giants in what we can do for others. That bottom image reminds us of the passage we read in Zechariah 12. In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. See that word defend. So that those who are feeble among you will at that day be like David. Like David defended the people of Israel. We can be like David in being a defense for others all around us. Isn't that what Undy Sunday is? It's calling us to be giants by doing little things to be a giant in the life of another. Isn't that what our dollar a week offering is? And we're going, We've already announced it, but we've crossed that $500,000, half a million mark of little $1 bills that fell into the plate. Every time you dropped a $1 bill, you were contributing to what will be a giant accomplishment. And... I think it's October 10th. You're going to be seeing more and more about that that we're going to have out at the Coronado Center, a celebration of having passed that landmark in little $1 bills. And I love it that it's a Michelangelo project, too. I know our weekly ringer says even now that applications for dollar a week grants are available. You guys like Michelangelo keep that secret until January. I love those three Sundays in January when it's revealed to everyone what your giant killer of a dollar bill is doing to bless ministries in our community. Our passion to be steeled and ready to continue to make a difference for others, not just for ourselves. Because when you defeat a giant, you become a giant.
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, our closing hymn will be number 714. I think I've gone a little long. Why don't we skip a verse there? (laughs) Is that all right? Whatever, whatever. We're going to be a little bit Baptist and just leave out the third stanza like we did in that first one, okay? So one, two, and four, let's stand together and sing, I know whom I've believed. Thank you for joining us in worship today. A special greeting again to our visitors. We hope that you've enjoyed the service and will come back and be with us again. Please come to Fellowship Hall, everyone, and join us with a time of fellowship now and and also a time of celebration uh, for Undy Sunday and the impact that we're having in our community through missions. Would you receive the benediction? And now may the love of God and the communion of Jesus Christ, the fellowship, the of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Now let us join hands as we sing the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father.